Good morning or afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, from wherever you may be joining us, if it's early in the morning or uh, late in the afternoon. Uh, we thank you very much for taking the time to join us today uh, for what we think is a, a very interesting and important topic within the industry. Uh, my name is Alex Rolf. I'm the Managing Director of Payments Cards and Mobile. And uh, thank you very much to our partners in this webinar in, in Worldline. Um, Today, we're talking about AI, um, artificial intelligence in, in, in banking and, and payments. Uh, and, and we certainly feel that, that AI is, is going to reinvent the consumer experience. And we have uh, some great speakers here today who are at the cutting edge of what's going on in, in AI and, and, and banking and, and the personal experience uh, to talk us through it. Um, firstly, a, a few housekeeping issues. Uh, this is a live event, of course. Uh, all the speakers are speaking live, and the Q&A at the end is live as well. If you have any technical issues, then please use the console in front of you. Uh, we have a team of um, uh, people at WorkCast who will be able to help you as quickly as possible, and they'll help you sort that out. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a live Q&A at the end, and we have three great speakers, so uh, please feel free to ask your questions uh, either at the end, or if you want to pop it in the questions box as we go along, that's absolutely fine as well. If your query relates to a specific slide, then please do make reference to that in the question, and then we can quickly get to it whilst we're answering them. Um, uh, for your information, the recording of this presentation and webinar will be made available to all uh, people that have registered at the end and also um, we'll be sending it out so you can share it with your, with your colleagues. So as I mentioned, thank you to our partners at Worldline and I would like now to pass on to Mathieu uh, Bartholomew who will take you through as the first speaker. So Mathieu, welcome please. Thanks, Alex. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Mathieu Barthelini, working uh, at Forline as a lead product, product manager, uh, especially focused on how uh, I can help my customers, so banks and financial institutions, in their digital transformation. And uh, I am in charge of our worldwide digital banking platforms, uh, so platforms that we are, uh, that we are uh, developing for customers to help them on several aspects. Uh, the open banking one, but also on other uh, topics such as conversational topics, which will be uh, part of the presentation today. Yes, I'll let you, George, introduce yourself. Yes, thank you, Matthew. Hello, everyone. My name is Georg Ludwigson. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Manika. Um, Manika is... Um, a global leader in, in personal finance innovation. We're an innovation partner to many of the leading banks in the world, helping them create uh, better customer experiences and, and new revenue streams. Uh, and many of those um, uh, projects we work with banks on involve personalization and um, AI algorithms. So uh, looking forward to the discussion today. And hello, my name is Micah. I am a conversational strategist and a UX designer. Um, and uh, I've been working in conversational with bank and finances uh, in industry and other industries for over a few years now. And I'm really looking forward to this presentation today um, as it will be joining uh, both uh, very um, practical insights into what conversational means for uh, finance and banking. And I'll, I'll leave it to you, Matthew, to continue. Yeah, forward. yeah. I, I, I move on. I move on. And why, why we are uh, here today, uh, why we are speaking about reinventing user experience and system experience today is because uh, Many media, uh, Michael and ourselves at Forline are working on a, on a product currently uh, to support our customers to uh, work on the personal uh, conversational banking topic, uh, bringing the expertise of our three companies uh, clearly to, because we are convinced that it will be the, the new way to engage customers in, uh, in, in, the, in the coming months and coming years. And 
to start, uh, I just want to take a few minutes to share with you uh, what are the, the uh, what are the, 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 the landscape of the banking industry today. Uh, I'm quite sure that a big part of you are aware that the banking landscape uh, is currently knowing a strong mutation, uh, which has started uh, in the last decade, uh, especially due to main, four main factors. Uh, new regulation first, uh, with uh, the PST2, uh, the GDPR, and new uh, AML rules, for instance, uh, but also uh, due to strong expectations from end users uh, who are looking for uh, uh, digital services which are more proactive, uh, more personalized, uh, more real-time, and at the end, uh, uh, more easy to use. Um, the rise of new technologies, uh, which is another factor, especially uh, around artificial intelligence, and it will be the topic today, and the blockchain as well, which is another quite interesting topic. And at the end, uh, the, the fourth factor is the rise of new entrants, uh, such as uh, new banks, uh, fintechs, and also the cases, of course. Uh, that said, uh, clearly, we are in a landscape uh, where the classical and historical role of bank is changing a, a lot and is disrupted. And I will just let the floor to uh, Georg, who will also, I think, put uh, uh, the light on, 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 on some, uh, some uh, competition and uh, its uh, vision about the landscape. So, George, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Matthew. I, I think um, what embodies uh, the trends, mega trends we are seeing in the landscape today is uh, in many ways the, the rise of, of the neobanks, which are currently um, defining what, what good looks like in, um, in terms of mobile banking. Um, of course, that's, there are many other trends happening, as you mentioned, like rise of open banking, uh, transition to cloud and SaaS, and, and all sorts of APIs and building blocks emerging that um, offer all sorts of new capabilities. But it's the rise of the neobanks that is probably one of the most prominent. And um, I want to put that in context with um, what the topic of today. So we are now seeing, um, I mean, the neobanks, and this is probably most pronounced in the UK, where they are getting substantial tractions with several million users, uh, very well funded, and, um, and, uh, and, and so on. Um, also, um, um, so what's happening is, is um, it's a gradual thing. Um, most of the incumbents still maybe have the salary account, but what they are increasingly seeing is, um, is kind of loss of transactions. They might, might see in their bank account salary in, uh, mortgage out, and utility one and two out, and then transfer to Monzo and nothing else for the rest of the month. So they're losing those customer touch points. And now we're at the level where um, one in three of UK millennials say that their primary banking relationship is with a challenger bank, although that, in most cases, is, is mixed. It's both with a challenger bank and someone else. But it's clear that this is um, kind of um, getting really serious. And taking that a bit further, um, I think what Apple is doing with Apple Pay and, and their Apple credit card that they launched in the U.S., last year and, and is coming to Europe this year is, um, is very interesting. They are doing in many ways similar things that the neobanks have done, simple uh, user experiences, simple onboarding, and, um, and they seem to have also this cult-like uh, following, like customers that are more like fans rather than, rather than customers, un unlike most banks. Um, and they seem to be doing a lot of the things that the neobanks have have pioneered. And um, I mean, I think the quite interesting question is here uh, in, in the topic of AI and, and, um, and personalization is why are people switching? And I think it's, it's obvious if you look at the functionality and, and, and the marketing of the, of the neobanks, is it's not because, at least not yet, because they have super sophisticated algorithms or, or, or AI solutions. It's, it's because they've got the simplicity right. The onboarding is super simple. They're telling people in very simple terms um, what, where, where they are spending the money, with whom they are spending the money, very simple uh, PFM and um, helping people understand where the money is going and, and simple kind of loyalty or cashback solutions, which you see in uh, all of these guys have. Um, so I, I think, and, and the interesting point to note here is relatively few of these 
um, have any any of those sophisticated technologies. Re Revolut does have a, a chatbot, but I think most people would agree that's probably the worst part of their user experience. Um, but this is all coming, but it's interesting that before you, it's not about AI or, or, um, um, or, or sophisticated algorithms, it's about kind of use cases, what people connect to. So the trick here is to start simple, start with the small data and, and, and simple personalization, but then gradually move to, um, to the uh, more sophisticated things. And that, um, I think, brings us to the second uh, part, which is to talk about personalization. What do we, what do we mean by personalization? Um, most mobile banking apps still more or less look the same to people. Of course, they have different transactions and bills and amounts in there, but they, they all look quite the same. Um, to me, I think in the, the most simplest term is, is that personalization is the difference between some valuable advice and, and spam, something irrelevant. And that's a huge difference. Um, it's simple, but, but making it real is, is not easy. That getting that right uh, can be extremely hard, but if you get it right, then, then that's a kind of very strong competitive advantage. And, and in some cases, that can involve very sophisticated um, kind of technology like AI. In other cases, it involves something much more simpler. So I think it's helpful to, to keep that in mind. Um, to illustrate with kind of what my company is working on, everything we do with, with banks to help create better user experiences is, is, you can say that is based on creating uh, some uh, kind of stories or use cases from transaction data. So we work with transaction data from bank accounts, credit cards, and, and try to kind of figure out interesting things about people's lives to help them um, basically with everyday money management. And if you think about it, like people's transactions, they, they tell, tell us an awful lot about yourself. Um, you, you can f figure out where you work, kind of what your hobbies are, where you live, and so on. There, almost everything you, uh, that, that it, there is to know about a person, you, you can get clues from, from, from people's kind of spending profiles. And um, I think we're still at a very early stage of kind of doing a good job of, of, of using that data to create something interesting for people. And, um, and it's simple things that, that, that you start with, things like um, discovery, which merchants might I like based on my current spending habits? Um, kind of how are my expenses trending? Can you find me discounts? Can you help me spend smarter and save? Um, I want to save more for my kind of future. Can, can you help me do that? I think. Um, we are at a very early stage in, in helping people uh, with, this, uh, with these questions. But um, it's been our kind of defining uh, vision of, of, of Monika that, that digital banking needs to evolve from a place to transact into more of a financial coach type user experience that, that tries to answer those questions. Um, if we then um, look at um, some more examples. So one of the things um, that we are currently working on is an example of, of personalization that, that is not using uh, kind of sophisticated AI algorithms, and then we'll have another example later, um, is um, helping people understand their environmental impact. Um, it, it turns out that by looking at a people's transaction history, you can do a pretty good rough estimate of their carbon footprint. For every dollar spent in a grocery store or on fuel or on airfare, uh, if you take the average uh, CO2 output for every dollar um, and, and kind of sum that up over a month or a year, you get a pretty decent estimate of, um, of people's carbon footprint. It's not perfect, but it's much better than, um, than, than, than what kind of ma manual uh, entry that, that most people are, are uh, don't bother doing. And um, for most practical purposes, it's fine. If someone wants to then um, offset their carbon footprint um, using a, a, a certified carbon offsetting uh, service, uh, making that really seamless and interesting. So, th so this, we think, is a good example of, 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 of making kind of it feel personalized. There's a lot of people that 
kind of want to take action against climate change. It's not about giving them a bad conscience, but giving them the option to understand, kind of get this estimate, and then if they want to take action, uh, choose from a, in a very easy way from certified uh, projects. So th this would be an example of an innovative way using uh, transactions to create a service that, that, that some people would, would really appreciate. And, and, and this is something we are working with several banks in Europe on um, uh, these days. Um, but then if we um, kind of move beyond personalization and, 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 and look at specifically kind of the AI aspect, um, I'm going to hand it back to Matthew to, to introduce that topic. Matthew, are you are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Sorry. Um, uh, yeah, I, I've uh, I was saying that um, we, are, we 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 already used uh, the, the 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 buzzwords AI or artificial intelligence uh, lots uh, a lot during the the, the beginning of, of this webinar, and I, I found it was maybe interesting just to share with the audience uh, some. Uh, some uh, some uh, information around what is really uh, hidden behind this, uh, these big buzzwords. So the, the, the people you can see uh, on, on the slide, the uh, many is in fact one of the phases of, of, the, of the artificial intelligence. Uh, so it's John McCarty, uh, who has defined in the, who had defined in the, in the 50s uh, the term artificial intelligence. Uh, what he what uh, he was working on uh, algorithms and programs to solve problems on 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 the, on the chess game, typically. And um, what you just need to understand is that artificial intelligence is much more a family of technologies that could be applied to accomplish uh, a task that human could execute. And uh, into these in, into these big families, there are a um, subset of technologies. Uh, that are especially used to qualify data and that can be also used to uh, uh, be in interactions between the end users. So inside the artificial intelligence family, there is the machine learning uh, technologies uh, that, are, uh, that can be used. And uh, if I have to summarize in few lines uh, what, what is machine learning, uh, basically it means uh, it's, it's practice uh, of using algorithms to pass data uh, to learn from this data and to make uh, uh, and find a solution uh, to uh, something, to a problem. Um, if I take uh, uh, an example in the banking industry, for instance, you can, th you can think to a, a problem which is, okay, I need to, to determine if a transaction is fraudulent or a genuine one uh, due to, to its attributes, for instance, uh, and you can resolve such, such problem uh, thanks to a large data set of transactions uh, which have already been ca qualified as a, as a fraudulent one or a genuine one. Inside the machine learning family, there is the deep learning um, um, technologies, which is, uh, in a nutshell, just a boosted machine learning approach where problems will be solved thanks to several layers as your brain trying to solve problems thanks to the, your, your, your neurons uh, networks. Um, if I have to take a simple example on, uh, on, on, a, on an industry field where a deep learning algorithm is applied, for instance, uh, I can uh, take the example of trying to analyze images uh, to, to, to steer a self-driving car, for instance. And in such problem, for instance, you, you, you will have two kinds of layers, uh, which will be in charge for the first one, for instance, to analyze uh, uh, the, the image uh, to check and to detect the, the lane lines, and another layer it could be used to detect cars or obstacles. So it's it's a more complex algorithms and a more complex approach. Uh, that being said, while well, it's a, it's a revolution, uh, if if you have a look uh, on, on on some figures on the global investment, for instance, uh, last year's uh, investment in artificial intelligence has reached more than 35 billion of dollars. 
uh, with, a, a deep, with a, a strong increase compared to 2018, uh, an increase of 44%. So there are lots and strong investments on such technologies, uh, which are so ex which are also um, uh, expect to more than double in the two next years uh, to reach 80 billion of dollars, meaning it's clearly a revolution. And the question is, okay, this is definition of artificial intelligence, and there, there, there is lots of technologies behind, but to solve which problems, and especially if we, if we are taking our, our problem, which is delivering um, uh, delightful experience to the end users, uh, beautiful digital experiences, and especially to answer to four problems that uh, customers have. Uh, so if I, if I just have to summarize, uh, the four uh, expectations of the end user, which are, I want to uh, have more convenience, more instantaneity for my services. Uh, I want to uh, have personalized service and consistency between the usages. On an artificial intelligence perspective, it means for me trying to solve four main uh, problems. The first one is solving a problem of knowledge by applying rule-based engine, for instance, to be able to categorize uh, data and to qualify data. The second point is to answer to a reasoning problem based on the qualified data and using uh, probably programming, for instance, uh, you will try to generate some insights, okay, uh, that will be consumed in the full customer journey. The two other problems to solve thanks to AI technologies is perceptions. Uh, meaning, for instance, uh, if you want to provide uh, a smooth uh, customer experience, uh, you need to understand what is asked by the end users by using, for instance, natural language understanding or natural language processing technologies. And the final um, problem to solve is the communication one. If you can also, on top of that, uh, be able to detect some, um, some sentiments in, uh, in, in the query uh, sent by the end users, you will definitely provide a personalized uh, experience, which is quite good. I will let the floor to, to, to Jock to continue on, on this AI topic. Yes, th thank you. I, I mean, yes, Matthew said, I mean, um, AI is an umbrella term over a very broad set of technologies and methods, but I want to maybe give you a few concrete examples from the world of finance to 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 see how this uh, is, is currently being applied. And, and uh, But before we get there, I think and that applies not just in financial services, but broadly with any AI or, or big data application, more or less. That um, that in almost all the um, in all such projects, uh, bulk of the work, which is 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 in the um, getting the data ready to be uh, for the algorithms to be applied on. So that means aggregating data, consolidating it, getting it in the same format, cleaning it up, uh, enriching it in a in a basic way. And um, typically, 70% of the total effort of any kind of AI project is based on getting the data ready. And uh, this is the unsexy part that is less talked about. But this, speaking from experience from my company, it, this is 70% um, of what we do. Many of the banks we work with are, um, th this is what you have to do first, getting control of the data, getting them all in the kind of same platform and, and ready to be applied for. So that is something to, to really keep in mind. Otherwise, if, if that's not under control, then, then you have garbage in, uh, garbage out. But once you have that in place, then uh, the fun stuff begins and you can start applying this in a focused way to very specific use cases or, uh, or, or challenges, often with really good results. Um, and, um, and now in the, in the context of open banking, we have, um, I mean, a lot of banks and other non-banks that are looking to exploit open banking to build some kind of personal finance application. There is um, um, also the challenge of aggregating data from different uh, financial institutions and to, for example, for any kind of use case that helps people combine data from different banks into one so they have a holistic view. And um, so, so that challenge of getting the data consolidated, aggregated, and, and consistent before you start applying, it has been, become bigger. But this is moving at a, a pretty fast pace, and this is one of the core things that Manika does with its uh, customers. But looking at the specific um, 
example then of what you can do. I'm just going to take two uh, very concrete uh, examples. So one is on segmentation, uh, and, and this is um, using a technology uh, or algorithm called collaborative filtering, which would be classified as, as a type of machine learning algorithm. You may know this algorithm from Amazon when they recommend books based on those you've already read, or from Netflix based on recommending movies based on the movies you've kind of watched in the past. And this is a, a, a pretty well-known algorithm that basically correlates um, a person's uh, kind of historical um, data with, uh, with also the, the whole universe of, of all users. So in the context of transactions and finance, what, what we have done and is, is, is part of our solution is we, we correlate um, people's spending, basically historical transactions, with uh, spending uh, data of all other users and that the output of that is a certain kind of correlation matrix that tells us in the context of individual users which merchants or, or businesses uh, or, or are, are most interesting to this, these people. The, the center image there is supposed to try to visualize this algorithm. It's always it's hard to visualize algorithms, but the different thickness of the lines between different merchants represents kind of strong or weak correlation. And, and the application when you have built this kind of um, kind of matrix for every user is that you can do some very interesting things. For example, you can help people with discovery of uh, new places or restaurants or cafes or whatever uh, merchant they may are likely to be interested in based on kind of their current spending patterns. And often, um, so people are used to this from the realm of books and movies, but not so much for, for spending. But we found it to work really well in many cases. So that if you go to this nightclub and these restaurants and uh, shop in this bookstore, you might want to try out um, kind of this kind of um, uh, merchant. Um, the example to the left uh, represents this, like based on your, uh, your past spending in restaurants and other merchants, we are recommending three restaurants you are likely to kind of be interested in. And we can take that further and show which restaurants are trending, by, represented by the flame, uh, show the price based on average spending in those restaurants, and, and so on. All based on only kind of historical anonymized transaction data of a set of users that has been correlated. Um, and this can be very powerful. Also, it can be, but it can be used for other things as well. If you look to the right, this is just a representation of a cashback offer. And um, if you have such a, a ranking of merchants for any, every user, um, you can do so much better job in kind of promoting discounts and offers because uh, most loyalty and discount programs today, you just have a bunch of discounts. They're not ordered or filtered for you. If aren't by this algorithm, we know that certain merchants are likely to be super interesting to, uh, to people. Sometimes that's just common sense, like merchants that are um, people shop with frequently or very similar merchants, but also sometimes based on kind of more complicated correlations. And then if you only promote the offers or discount that merchants that people really like, then they perceive this as great service rather than spam or, 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 or annoying advertising. So, so that's one concrete example of an algorithm that works really well once you have the data under control. Another example, real quick, is from um, kind of uh, upsells, upselling. Um, one recent project we've, we've done with a bank in the Nordics is to kind of, in a similar way, analyze transactions of, of all customers and kind of figure out which customers are more likely to want certain types of credit cards uh, based on similar uh, algorithms. And when you and, and, and the results of that is typically something around the 3x increase in the card uptake if you focus the sales message on the, on the segment of users that have a spending pattern that correlates strongly to those that have already kind of uh, use, are already using those credit, credit card products. So um, instead of giving you a, a many kind of broad examples and, and talking about because AI, as, as Matthew says, AI machine learning, these are just buzzwords and technology that are like any other technology, meaningless unless you apply them to some real-world uh, 
problem and use case. That's where value is created. Um, so, um, so these are two examples. Um, but um, um, I'm now going to hand it over to to Mike, who's going to take a kind of deeper example with conversational um, uh, UX. Over to you, Mike. Uh, thank you so much, um, Georg. But I think Matt, you had a few things to say first about conversational. Yeah. Bank. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Mike. No worry. Uh, yeah. I j j just few words regarding. It. So we we've just uh, seen with uh, with Georg uh, the importance of applying artificial intelligence and the role of artificial intelligence and AI technologies to qualify the data and. Uh, to generate uh, valuable insights uh, to better engage the end users uh, in uh, an overall customer journey and to bring real value to the end users. Uh, in, the, in the following slide, I just want to underline uh, the other part of the iceberg, which is how once we have the insights and the data that is, that is qualified, uh, could we interact with the end users? And I guess that everybody around the call uh, has already a mobile, uh, has already played with its mobile or website, of course. But for us, the, the next way to engage the end users will definitely be thanks to conversations. And lots of our customers today, uh, with which we are trying to, uh, to, to help on this topic, are seeing conversational banking, uh, in my opinion at least, uh, and compare the conversational banking to chatbots. And for me, it's a r restrictive vision of what is conversational banking. For me, conversational banking is wider than that. It's really a real strategy that has to be defined and uh, implemented uh, as the next steps uh, to provide uh, personal experience, either on the text, but also on the voice channels and taking in, into account natural languages. For me, it's key to think to search new interfaces. If you have a look on the, 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 the three uh, key figures uh, below the definitions for me, people are here. I mean, hand users are ready to use such new interfaces. So you have definitely to, to define what is your conversational banking strategy. And to help our customers to think about what strategy could be applied, uh, we are usually uh, trying to apply this kind of framework, so the 4A framework. Uh, and the idea of the 4A framework is to help our customers to define the audience. At the end, what would be the audience of your conversational interfaces? Uh, do you want to address uh, SMEs, retail uh, consumers uh, inside this segment? Do you want to address only um, uh, Gen Y millennials? and so on. So first thing to your audience. The second point, of course, which is maybe the, the first one is aims. Uh, map your conversational strategy to your business goals. Do you intend to reduce your costs on, on your conversational, uh, thanks to your, thanks to conversation, uh, sorry, thanks to conversation uh, on, on your customer services uh, service? Uh, do you intend to promote some products inside your conversations? So you have to, to map these business goals to the conversations. Uh, the third part, uh, the third point is uh, what is the approach you want to select uh, to, 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 to uh, make more concrete your strategies. Uh, and behind this point, the idea is try to set priorities, try to identify the services you want to launch and really uh, think small first and enhance uh, the experience provides through conversational platforms by adding services in a progressive rollout. This is the idea. And at the end, apply the technologies based on uh, your plan, which normally has been defined in the three previous steps. Uh, before uh, letting uh, the floor to Michael, I just want to, to, to share with you two concrete uh, applications of uh, or for a framework. The first one is based on the on 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 the on the experience uh, launched by Bank of America uh, with its Erica uh, conversational platforms. Uh, I just want to, to to point out two points. If you have a look on the audience uh, uh, with Erica, Bank of America uh, has reached more than 10 million of regular users on its 
conversational uh, solution. More than one third uh, of its overall um, digital customers, which is quite huge. And what is interesting also to to uh, to point out is um, uh, the 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 speed of uh, generations behind the consumers. If you have a look of the of the numbers below the below the, the audience, uh, the, the general audience, you will see that of course uh, around 50 percent of the audience uh, are millennials, but 50 of the percent are other generations. And it's due to uh, the convenience of providing digital services through such new interfaces. And the second point I, I just want to underline is uh, if you have a look on, on the approach selected by uh, Bank of America, you will remark that they have started small. They have started by providing classical daily banking services. So you, you initially you, you, you were able to ask to Erica, okay, uh, what, is, uh, what is my balance? I just want to be in touch or take a rendezvous with my advisor. So start small, and they have uh, in, the, in the next releases uh, had it more complex conversations uh, to deliver more complex uh, features to their end users, such as features around spending, the battery world, uh, features around the merchant management and stuff like that. And the other concrete example I just want to share in a few seconds is uh, the example of Capital One. Here, the only point I, 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 I will uh, point out is uh, the approach. One, one more time, if you have a look of the strategy uh, applied by Capital One, they have thought in, in 2015 with a beta version, and they have applied a real progressive rollout of, of such a service by uh, implementing first features and conversation around credit cards. You can easily consult credit card balance. Uh, but why not uh, having conversation to block or unblock accounts? I mean, it's not a complex feature, and you can add it in, in such interface. Uh, and uh, I will finish that part by just uh, one slide, uh, just to give you our recipe, uh, it's our, our vision, our point of view. Uh, what, what, what could be the, the, the right and the good recipe to engage uh, customers uh, thanks to conversational AI? For, for, for us, there are four main points uh, to address. Uh, first, you have to design the menu, of course. Uh, at the end, uh, what is the value and what use case, what, what are the use cases you expect to, uh, to, uh, to deliver to, thanks to conversational experience? The second point is uh, you have the menu, work on the recipe now. So define, define the conversational logic. Uh, you have a use case, how and what are the paths, the happy paths uh, that have to be delivered to the end users. Uh, it's really important to, 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 to work on the recipe, of course. Then select your ingredients. Uh, so more than uh, working on each, uh, each ingredient, you have to merge the ingredients, meaning on a conversational point of view, you need to define use case and things to the bridges between the use case. As an end user, I maybe want to ask uh, information on my account by asking just what is my balances, but maybe I want quickly to switch to a transfer conversations and get back to my to, 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 to information of my account. And you cannot and you don't have to provide siloed conversations. You, you really need to make bridges between conversations. And the last advice uh, I could give is um, we, we've talked a lot about artificial intelligence and the way you can automate uh, the delivery of digital services, but also think to human and how you will um, make the bridge uh, and make the end over uh, with with the human because we are speaking about okay launching conversation uh, on, on 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 simple use cases first but uh, when you will implement a more complex one probably your hand user wants to, to get more precise advice and only a human can give such advice so make the bridge with humans it's really important and I led the thought to, to Michael for which is or experts regarding uh, the way to design conversations. Michael, the floor is yours. Th thank you so much, Matthew. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you for all of this insight. And uh, what my main takeaway uh, from what you just left, Matthew, was was about starting small, and that's exactly um, 
my advice as well. And that's something uh, that will come up uh, quite a few times. But let's take a, a step back and think about exactly that, the users, who they are and how they are um, how they are feeling about all of this conversational uh, and, and artificial intelligence uh, hype or usage. Um, so most of all, um, what motivates uh, people today to get into conversational, whether it's banking or otherwise, uh, mostly it's about utilitarian symbolic and social benefits. Um, and what does that mean? Well, basically, that means that they want it to be a an experience that is useful to them, so that they they can accomplish a task that they esteem being useful. Uh, social benefits is also about status, about being able to do this through conversational um, and and brag a bit about it. Um, also, uh, it's related to the fact that it has uh, has to be quick, uh, that it's quicker, uh, that it's more convenient. Uh, and I think that's a key takeaway that uh, if you um, are deciding which use case you will be implementing for your conversational banking, um, utilitarian motivation is really the biggest one. And so uh, thinking about what is going to be useful to the user uh, and what will be, and enable the user to do things more quickly through conversational than otherwise. Um, the biggest pain points with conversational, and especially when it comes to voice technology, for example, is the perceived security and privacy concerns. Um, obviously, this is not just a problem uh, that is related to voice uh, user interface devices. However, uh, because these voice user interface devices are quite new, um, the threshold for establishing um, that uh, that trust with uh, personal data is, is a lot higher. Um, so that's something to take into account when you kind of decide on which use case are we going to start with. So let's talk about that a bit. Um, Whenever people are um, faced with new interfaces, they go what we call a through a, a journey of building trust. Um, and so Nielsen Norman has a framework for this. It's called the pyramid of trust. And so basically, when um, you're confronted with a new interface, you go from having no trust at all in this new interface towards having a willingness to commit an ongoing relationship. Uh, when you think about it, a um, couple of years ago, we didn't all walk around with smartphones uh, in our hands. Uh, and uh, it's funny to see that today is actually the no smartphone day um, because it has become such a habit that we now need days to not have it in our hands. Whereas uh, a couple of years ago, we were still wary of uh, trusting this device with our personal information, leaving our credit card numbers in apps, etc. And now we just give away our data um, without even thinking about it. So conversational interfaces will also go through this, uh, what we call pyramid of trust. It will also move from no trust established at all to an ongoing relationship. And it is our um, goal, but also our duty um, to uh, when we decide upon use cases, when we decide to invest this conversational banking space, uh, to make sure uh, that the first interactions for our users are perceived as being useful. How do you move up into this pyramid of trust with your users while well, by starting small, by starting with very basic features and showing them that they can trust your app, your conversational interface with these basic things, basic functionalities. A basic con functionality can simply be, for example, like Matthew said, blocking your card. Um, some, something else, um, that might be very interesting is just getting some broad information about the bank uh, or about opening hours uh, of bank, banks near you and so forth. Um, and then little by little, when, um, 
when these basic uh, features are being perceived as useful, as being as successful, then users will more and more um, easily um, give you uh, access to to more personal information, and you will be able to tailor then with everything George explained, AI, etc., data, and you will be able to proactively um, give them content that is useful to them. But it's all about establishing a relationship. And so how do you establish a relationship other than starting small? Well, basically, there are four main components to creating trust. The first one is personalization, which gives the user the impression that you know them, because first step in a relationship is you know me. Um, and so George talked about this quite a bit already with uh, personalization, and um, so I won't go into that a lot further, uh, but it's a really important cornerstone. Um, proactive conversations. So a second step in establishing a relationship with, uh, with, with the user is you know what I need. So having proactive conversations, just as also George told you about, being able to proactively suggest content um, is a good step toward creating that connection, creating that link. Um, but that's just one side of the medal. That's just you tailoring to the user. The thing is, the user also has to have the feeling that they know you, that they know what you are about as a brand, that they know what this conversational um, interface is about, and that they know how you feel about them. It's a, it's a two-way street, and that's really important. So basically, um, how do you go about the fact um, that you can take this uh, conversational um, connection uh, into the entire con uh, consumer journey? Um, because as Matthew said, Conversational is just not about just the chatbot. It's not about having a uh, voice application on a voice smart speaker. It's about integrating conversational in every step of the way, every step of the customer journey from discovery to conversion to the experience. And so basically, use cases you can um, tailor for each step of the way. Um, for anonymous users, that this can be about general topics like information out about your products, uh, about the bank, about the values of the bank. Um, for a prospect, it can be about onboarding them, registering them, um, and engaging with them cross-channel. So not only uh, after visiting your website, while well, conversational can, can be an extra link to create that connection to make sure that they become clients. And then for clients, it can be about tailored insights with secure and personalized conversational environment. And as you can see, as the user grows in trust, not only towards this conversational interface, but also towards your bank, you can also start building out more um, specific features and more secured features. So as I said, the fact that you take your uh, customer and customer consumer by the hand and that you proactively give them content um, tailored to where they are in their customer journey um, will help you help them. Um, so basically, uh, there's three um, levels to this. First of all, obviously, when interacting with a conversational agent, the agent should be able to answer the question. If it isn't, uh, if it can't, then you have to provide the user with a possible um, human handover. Make sure that he gets the solution. Anticipate next question actions, of course. Um, so that's all what George was also talking about. So you answer the actual question. You anticipate what the next action might be. As Matthew said, if you are looking at your balance, you might also want to do transfers just after and then suggest useful content, as we said before. And so moving towards uh, the user getting to know you, there are a few things that you can do, and they're mostly related to tone of voice. Uh, your tone of voice, whether it's spoken or in written word, should be unique and on brand. Uh, your bank or your financial um, business is not the same as someone else's. 
and that's really important. So it shouldn't your conversational content should integrate your overall brand image and be unique to your brand. Make it stand out. Um, you also you need to be adaptable to specific situation and emotion. You don't just decide on one tone of voice that goes through all your use cases. Tone of voice has to be in relation with what is what the user is going through. Uh, for example, uh, someone whose credit card was just stolen or lost and is a very stressful situation uh, would not at all handle well a very dynamic pump it up content um, and then be exclusive inclusive so um, when you um, design your conversational agent um, don't make it a character you can give it a tone of voice and a personality which is really important to make that connection without actually making it something personified I usually say you don't have to be uh, a white male with a red nose to be funny. And so um, I'm moving really quickly here because there's a lot to say about conversational UX design, but basically conversational UX is all about researching who your users are, uh, knowing them, knowing what they need and when they need it. You can do this through quantitative and qualitative data, through user research, uh, defining and prioritizing the use cases and the tone of voice we just talked about, designing the conversations because it's, AI is not just a machine that you feed a lot of data and then they just magically start talking. Um, so there is some design work to be done around content about information architecture and then refine it uh, with the usage. This is not um, an app that you make once and then you leave it out there for six months and see how it goes. Um, conversational design and conversational technology overall is an ongoing process and an ongoing refinement. And that's it. I'll leave the floor to you, Matthew. Yes. So, uh, to, yeah. Thank you. Just as a conclusion, so I I, I will let you uh, conclude, Alex. But how? Could we help you if you have any uh, questions or uh, concern regarding the conversational banking uh, topic? Uh, as I told you, as an introduction, uh, we are working uh, uh, closely and uh, with with Meniga and Michael, of course, to to help our customers on such a topic. Especially thanks uh, to our conversational platforms allowing to support several. Uh, conversation in the in, in the banking area and putting the expertise of Meniga in terms of uh, transaction transaction categorization and insights and the expertise of Michael in the design of conversations. So one more time, thanks for having uh, listeners and uh, I let you uh, the floor Alex is, is fine for us. And one more time, thanks for for joining this webinar. Yes, yeah, so <clears throat> I would say. Um, Firstly, thank you very much to Mathieu, George, and, and Micah. What a thoroughly interesting webinar. Um, an awful lot of information in there, um, as you can all imagine, with a topic so fresh and, uh, and, and growing so fast. Um, I just want to repeat that uh, we have a, a, a short period of time for some, for some questions now, which we'll do in a second, and, and a reminder that this recording will be made available on, on demand um, from, from my perspective there's definitely a few slides there that I'd like to uh, listen back on but um thanks guys that was that was really interesting so let's uh let's get straight into questions as as we mentioned at the beginning uh you can uh use the dashboard now to ask any questions you have uh, if they relate to a specific slide just let us know what that is so uh Micah as we um closed off with you we'll we'll uh, start off with you on the questions um, and the one here that we've got is uh, we've spoken a lot about uh, data and AI, but how do you take care of uh, privacy, data protection, and this type of topic? Any any thoughts on that? Um, well, there's there's quite a lot to say about it, but I'll try not to go off into a rant. Um, <laughs> but definitely, privacy is and security. Uh, that's one of the biggest pain points today for users. Um, so it's definitely something that you need to address, but you don't only need to address it from a conversational uh, point of view, but I think it needs to be part of the overall um, reflection uh, that we have towards digital banking products. Um, 
more and more security issues are being surfaced. And of course, um, we also have the GDPR uh, to take to, to to take into account. These are um, things that uh, don't complicate the um, don't have to be seen as complicating the conversational journey. Um, but on the contrary, uh, I think they are reassuring towards the user and help build that trust I was talking about. Um, some um, strategies around that have to do with very traditional um, four-digit codes and so forth and so forth. But there are also a lot of more evolved technologies starting to be really performing uh, with um, biometrics and voice biometrics that are really interesting to look into and look out for. I think, Matthew, perhaps you can add to that. Mm, yeah, I, I, I would maybe just add one point to mention the, the GDPR topic. Uh, I, I, I think that everyone around the call knows that GDPR means also uh, harming the content of the end users. So for me, one of the of the key topics to address uh, on top of the biometric aspect and the strong customer authentication is how uh, do you foresee the capture of the content of the end users in a conversation? I mean, so. Just thinking to uh, play some uh, some uh, some uh, some uh, information in a conversation, just to inform actually the end users uh, about how uh, this data would be used in such a conversation, and to get its formal approval is, is, is already a, a good point and a good practice in my vision. And the other point is um, what is key in such a topic, uh, especially in the conversational topic, is. Uh, you, 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 will, you will need to train your systems uh, to make it uh, smaller and smarter, uh, meaning that we absolutely need to, uh, um, to, to keep a track of the conversations. But who says uh, uh, you have to keep track of conversations means you, need, you, you will store data. So what, what are the algorithms that could be applied to search for these conversations? What is the strategies that could be applied um, to archive such a conversation in, in case of a dispute and stuff like this? Uh, we have solutions for that, I mean. But yes, we absolutely and definitely need, in my vision at least, to, to take care about the end user's content and to find strategy around the strong system authentication and the way we are um, storing the data, especially the conversations uh, for the training purpose. This is my, my vision on that. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you, Mathieu. So let's um, let's move on to you, uh, George. Uh, a second question we've got here, <clears throat> and um, I read it like this: We've we've talked about PFM mainly focused on the retail banking consumers. What's your vision on the BFM topic and the way to provide financial insights to SMEs and corporates? No, that's a great question. I mean, although my company has primarily worked on the PFM side for individuals and households, we, we also do considerable work with, um, with yeah, particularly smaller corporates, so SMEs and, and kind of sole proprietors. Um, and many of, we find that many of the things we work on for households and individuals are super relevant as well for SMEs and some even more relevant. Um, uh, small business owners and employees are very busy people. They value time-saving things enormously. So there are certain use cases that resonate very strongly there, such as um, kind of simple weekly and monthly summaries, short-term cash flow projection and management, really help them at a glance understand what's happening in the next two weeks. Are my customers paying me? Am I late paying my suppliers? And, and so on. And, and uh, also we find generally that um, we, we think there's, there's an opportunity for banks in many markets there. This is, seems feels to me to be an underserved market. And um, once you can help SMEs with a kind of cash flow management, you can also help them with their cash conversion cycle through credit and, and other things. Um, there are more examples like just simple case of searching for transactions, convenient for people, but for like a company with 10 people with a lot of customers and many transactions made sometimes across many bank accounts, just that use case can save enormous amount of time we found in research with one Nordic bank. So, um, so yeah, I mean, SMEs is a, is a very relevant um, segment to serve in this way as well. Thank you. Uh, Mathieu, anything to add on, on, on the BFM topic? 
No, not in France. I think it's worth. It. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> we we do have um, we've got one minute left, so it's a it's a quick fire round if you like. And uh, yeah, let's start with you, Mathieu. So, what will the next must-have features in the conversational platform of tomorrow be? Uh, good question, Alex. For, for, for me, definitely, it will be uh, the fact to take into account the the sentiment or behavior on the behavior analysis uh, features. Uh, so, being able to catch signals regarding the the, the sentiments of, of the end users uh, to better handle uh, human handover, for instance, and, and such like this. Okay. We are the premise of such uh, features. Okay, thank you, uh, Micah. Any thoughts on the must-have features for, for, for of tomorrow? Uh, yes, um, so um, I could totally agree with Matthew, um, and then I would say that um, it's great to be able to analyze uh, the sentiment and the behavior of the users, but it's even better if you take it a step further and then tailor the conversation uh, towards uh, those sentiments that you've analyzed. Uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, taking things further, I think it has to be about making sure that we provide value and integrating, as George said as well, um, bank, conversational banking, not as banking per se, but as service, uh, as providing a service and being a partner to uh, our customers' uh, day-to-day lives, uh, money being an enabler of um, life choices. Okay, and, and very quickly, George, any, any, final, any final words for us? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think um, what we are most interested in there and, and believe that where this is headed is to, in summary, in a nutshell, help people become smarter consumers. I think we'll see much more of not just discounts and offers, but really more sophisticated ways of helping people optimize their subscription and, and, and kind of have businesses compete for their business. There's an enormous kind of evolution in um, in, in, in this topic, so kind of merging transaction data with, with smart uh, kind of um, uh, coaches or virtual coaches that can, or a virtual assistant that can help people optimize their spending. I think there is a lot of value to be created there. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So uh, we, we've just passed the hour. Um, from my perspective, I want to say thank you to Worldline once again for, for partnering with us to, to deliver another kind of very interesting webinar from the cutting edge. Personal thanks to Mathieu, George, and Micah for, for taking their time to put these slides together and presenting it in such an interesting way. Um, as mentioned before, this will be made available very soon and uh, wish you all a very good day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.